morning, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us for the webinar, Creating the Control Room of the Future Today. My name is Nicole Bamford and I'm the moderator for today's event. On behalf of Leslie and the team, we thank you for joining us. This presentation will be given by Vicki Knott, CEO and co-founder at Crux OCM, and her presentation promises to be well worth a listen. Before we get started, here are some quick administrative points. During the webinar, if you have questions for Vicki, please submit them in the Q&A box on your screen, and these will be answered during the question portion of the session. Likewise, for any technical issues, please write them into the Q&A box, and we'll get to them right away. The widgets on your screen can be resized and dragged around for your viewing preferences. We encourage you to visit the Resource Center on your screen for additional content and resources we and our sponsors have provided for you. So make sure you're sitting comfortably, and I'll now hand it over to Vicki so we can begin. Great, awesome, thanks, and uh, nice to talk to a screen of everybody. So uh, I'm Vicki, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Crux OCM, uh, here to talk about the future of autonomous control rooms. Um, so here's a, a quick agenda for us. We'll talk about um, you know, our experiences, so I do come from industry. Um, we'll talk about RIPA and the control room of the future. Uh, some use cases have got, got quite a bit of data here, but we'll move through that quickly. Um, why software solutions matter, uh, a fun announcement, and of course, some, some closing thoughts and Q&A. So on to the next slide. Um, this, this is a, a great image I found online, and it, it describes really well how if something's going sideways in a control room, uh, how a control room operator is having to move around the screen to, to accomplish the actions to get um, to either get a plant back into stable uh, into a stable state or starting up an asset uh, or something like that. So you can see how there's a lot going on. So I want to show, you know, kind of get the empathy going here, right? Like how how difficult is this job and how crucial is this job to the to the performance of, of these multi-billion dollar assets? So, you know, we've got we've got our, our frustrated fellow, um, you know, in a control room, there can be thousands of set point commands issued. Um, hundreds of alarms acknowledged and dozens of phone calls answered. Um, and all of this, like I said, is happening in the control room, which is the brain of the operation. So how do we fundamentally reduce stress, overwork, and inefficiencies in the control room? So we, we would look at reducing human factors. We want to be increasing our revenue and decreasing our costs, um, increasing our asset longevity, decreasing emissions. Uh, so, so how do we actually do all of that? And all of that too, I love to point out, um, efficiency is green. So the more throughput you can get for the existing assets, um, the more efficient they are, the more profitable they are, the less likely you are to have to build new assets, especially if you have a really large asset base. So imagine if a control room operator could control a complex control, could control complex procedures of an asset with one button. So complex procedures being a startup. Uh, a shutdown on pipeline operations, something like a swing. Imagine if all that could be done with one button. You know, we do that on our phone. So let's go to the first poll question. How much do you think Crux can reduce control room commands by? So the commands that an individual control room operator is issuing. I'll give everybody, uh, you know, 10 seconds to think about this skill testing question. I think that's 10. Okay, let's go to the results. Up to 99, okay. Some people have read my website. <laughs> awesome, yes, and that, and, and that is correct, up to 99%. So, you know, automating out um, all of those intricate procedures, checklists, and rules of thumb for control room operators. So, you know, something that I, uh, is, is a very uh, hot topic right now, and we wanted to make sure we touched on very early, is uh, positively impacting your ESG initiatives with Crux OCM. So, um, you know, we've done some work in the LNG space where we've proven that we can uh, reduce emissions by 45% um, on, on a startup of, of an LNG asset. Uh, we've, you know, the 99% reduction in human in human factors, um, you know, as reported by Thimza, I believe it's almost 70% of uh, accidents in the pipeline space are related to human factors, uh, whether those be safety or environmental accidents. Um, up to 4% increased flow rate, resulting in revenue maximization from existing assets. So, getting more of what you have, increasing the utilization of those assets. 
and then a uh, 40% reduction in the pressure and flow variations resulting in uh, increased asset lifespan. So minimizing that probability of stress corrosion cracking. So, so you know, come into trading on your control room can have all of these benefits that, um, that you know, other technologies may have, uh, but, you know, the control room, that is, that is the crux of the operation, of course. So current uh, operation versus RIPA enabled operation. So um, RIPA being robotic industrial process automation, we call it that because we like to nod towards um, the great work that's been done in RPA. Uh, RPA, you know, of course, automating human workflows for how um, the finance and legal groups uh, work with files. Now, we like to think of the exact same thing. Uh, for control room operators, you know, these are human workflows. They just happen to be uh, manipulating physical assets and thus uh, the mathematics behind them be a little bit more complicated than simply rules-based execution. So your current operations, you know, hundreds to thousands of control point changes. Um, your operators are juggling uh, many concurrent tasks and these compl com complex operations and your different control room operators, of course, result in varying operation. So we want to simplify that down to one control point change, or maybe it's three or four. If you want to acknowledge some things, you know, we, we love to get control room operators input on what they want to see and do. Um, and we're enabling the prioritization of the higher value tasks, uh, resulting in revenue maximization, of course. So and another thing is the codification of knowledge. So, you know, your, your 30 year trained top control room operator, when they go to retire, how do you capture that knowledge besides paper procedures to make sure that your assets and these new folks that come on are, are operating as efficiently um, as those folks. So, so another thing that we do love to say is um, you're not gonna get into a plane without a pilot or without autopilot software. Yet our control rooms have pilots, our control room operators, but we do not have autopilot software for them. Industry has been heavily focused on the automation of the, uh, of the assets and industrial automation of, of uh, pieces of equipment rather than how people work. So robotic industrial process automation, like, like I already chatted about, I think I already went through this slide. I preempted it a little bit for you guys. So like I said, the, uh, you know, the nod to RPA, um, however, of course, you need to take into account the hydraulics of your assets, mass transfer of your assets, separation principles of your assets uh, to be able to automate how your control room operators uh, execute. So they've created mental models. Um, the goal of RIPA is to recreate their mental models and simplify their workflows. So here is our uh, solution stack. Um, so all of the, we, we do use, um, you know, a bunch of different technologies to enable this type of, uh, this type of work. Um, so we will, like I said, we'll use dynamic physics, we'll use uh, control theory, we will use rules-based logic, we'll use ML if we need. Um, the goal is to automate how the control room operator executes procedures. It's not, you know, we're not just a generic AI ML data analytics tool. Um, the goal is, is very specific. So this first layer of technologies are really the execution layer of technologies. So they're the ones that have closed the loop and are actually executing on behalf of the control room operator. So they, you know, they enter in that simplified command and then it executes for them. These, the, uh, the items that go on top are the optimizing layers. So um, in pipeline, for example, you may want to optimize your, your DRA injection as your drag reducing injection, or you might want to optimize your power. That might be something you'd want to do in, in a gas plant environment as well, um, in, or optimizing um, reducing emissions in a, in a gas uh, pipeline, so on across your compressors. So that's where these layers would go. These layers would calculate those optimizations and then communicate them to the closed loop layers that execute on behalf of the control room operators. So where does RIPA work? RIPA works um, across the supply chain. So if there is a control room, um, there is an application. Um, we've also actually had some interest from folks in utilities, so coal plants, hydro plants, um, of course, LNG, as I talked about before, um, we're super interested in, in wastewater as well. So, so lots of applications. Right now, we are definitely focused in the oil and gas space, starting with, uh, with midstream. So PipeBot, um, we'll go through you know, uh, a few examples um, in a bit more detail of RIPA in action and the value that can be provided to control room operators and thus companies. So oil and refined products transmission lines. Um, so, you know, in summary, you know, we are increasing uh, the ROI and reducing costs. 
reducing the number of commands up to 99%, um, enhancing the asset integrity and automating those operational tasks. So we'll go through a few slides that are a bit more in detail, but I wanted to add this slide here in case anyone wants to watch the recording um, and, and dig in a little further. So increasing the revenues and decreasing costs with PipeBot. Um, on the left, you have the uh, control room operator startup. On the right, you have a PipeBot startup. So as you can see, the, the pressure cycling from a PipeBot startup is, is significantly less. So great news over time with respect to the wear and tear on equipment. And you can also see to get up to, to full rate um, took quite some time on both of those, both of those assets um, and combined with the overshoots and the undershoots. So packing and, and unpacking of the line. Um, Crux was able to get up to speed here uh, quite a bit faster. I believe this one was about 30% faster. We have done about 40% faster as well. Um, so decreasing that start time increases your frequency at max rates. So if on this pipeline, for example, there, we were at 85% utilization, and this change got us to even 86% utilization, that can be millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on the, uh, the assets that, that folks have. Um, so stopping revenue losses, of course. So, so something that's happening in the in transmission pipeline systems, so either batched uh, batch crude systems or refined product systems, are uh, batch transitions. So control room operators are having to uh, babysit these batch transitions. It says that I have an animation. Oh, I didn't know I had one. Okay, so control room operators are having to babysit these batch transitions um, and make sure that they are constantly staying at max rate. So one of my former employers, we called that natural reduction factor. Um, PipeBot automatically makes those set point changes for the control room operator, maintaining that max rate for them. So ensuring that we are hitting that, you know, capturing that lost revenue. I think we lost the automations. That's okay. Um, there was some... There was data on here of, uh, you know, a theoretical calculation of how much uh, value that is for, for, control, or for the control room operators and the assets. I'll just read it off for you from the other slide because this, the anim we forgot to fix the animations. Well, on this one, yeah, so if we're, you know, if we're losing about, you know, 150, 300 or 450 barrels, um, each time that this happens and you have, uh, you know, across 15 pump stations and, uh, and there's 15 batch transitions a month. If you multiply that out for even losing just 150 barrels, um, each time that those transitions are happening, you're looking at a 1.2 million, uh, per year additional revenue that can be, can be captured. So if you're looking at, um, you know, 450 barrels that are being lost from these types of events, you know, at three bucks a barrel, you're looking at like 3.6 million a year in additional, additional revenue that's just being uh, ghost barrels, really, that are just being left on the table. Oh, it did come up. There it is. Okay, great. <laughs> I just don't know how to use, work this machine. So yeah, so here's the summary. And again, for the, for the recording, so you guys can see it later. Um, so reducing our human interactions with PipeBot. So I talked about that a little bit before. Um, so, you know, the real thing here is making sure that our control room operators are working on these higher level tasks. So, you know, they're able to answer the phone. They're able to talk to someone who's coming in and asking questions. And they're not just super hyper-focused on, on this startup or this shutdown or this swing. Um, and, and frankly, I've broken, broken a sweat doing it before. So, uh, so, you know, making sure that they have the time for that. Um, so you can see here the, the different in, in specifically with PipeBot, these are the different um, actions that we have automated. So startup swing, flow rate change, batching, shutdown, and DRA scheduling, um, and you know up to 99%. So here's the, the specific calculations for each of those tasks. But this is the, you know, a little more digging into exactly what can be automated, what procedures can be automated in a control room to help those operators. So GatherBot is a, another example for everyone. Um, so oil gathering systems, oil pipeline gathering systems. So here is the overview and summary, um, quite similar to PipeBot, except the actual functionality, again, is different. So increasing the ROI and reducing costs um, reduces the number of commands issued by the control room operator up to 99%. This one was quite a lot because your control room operator is starting and stopping um, all of your lacks. Um, you know, it's quite involved. If they forget to start a lack, that they could get that tank level alarm. Um, if they keep a lap, lack on too long, they're going to get that low tank level alarm. Um, so keep, they have to be very mindful of this. Um, so enhancing the asset integrity, of course, as you're bringing these lacks up and down, you're bringing the asset through even more 
pressure cycling than a transmission line would. Um, so, of course, you want to be conscious of the potential for stress corrosion cracking. Um, automate those operational tasks. So, so, so very similar again to pipe bob. Um, an interesting thing that we found when working with a client on this was actually um, increasing the, the rateability. So automating um, the start-stop and optimizing um, the start-stop of these lacks for maximum throughput um, actually increase the rate, increases the rateability of the asset, which then increases your, um, your, your ability to schedule in tank, thus freeing up more tank volume or giving you more confidence around the tank volume that you have for leasing. Um, so this is, a, a, you know, the, by tightening up your, um, your statistical distribution of, of uh, the volumes that are coming into those tanks, you get much more predictability. So that's kind of a neat, a neat, um, a neat benefit. And of course, if you can sell that tank volume, uh, there's dollars there. So this one here is, uh, oops, go back to that one. Um, so maximizing the nominations revenues uh, with GatherBot. So um, one thing that we've done with the GatherBot system is enabling your control room operator to uh, use utilize a live calculator to determine how much additional uh, volume they can take on the system. So if you've been in a control room, you know, you get a call from oil scheduling, hey, um, can we take, you know, 100 more barrels an hour on this lack? The shipper has some extra volume. They really need to get it moving. Um, control room operator has kind of figured out. Maybe it's trial and error. Maybe you have a bunch of meetings with, um, with engineering and scheduling to try and figure it out. Well, we've taken all that away. All they have to do is push a button. They can, they then are calc, it'll calculate for them on that lact how much additional volume they can take. They're able to communicate that back to scheduling. And then once they change the nominations on that lact, the rest of the system is auto calculated to go back to maximizing throughput um, for, for, uh, for the system. So again, if you're getting an average additional noms of 100, 200, or 400 um, due to these benefits, um, you can be getting up to to or even more than um, 10 million a year um, at the three bucks a barrel toll. You know, just, just an example is three bucks a barrel. I know everyone's tolls are different, but uh, we like to use three because it's nice and round. Um, so lots of opportunity there to get, uh, to get that additional revenue. So reducing human interactions, again, with GatherBot, um, this one was, was quite significant because once the gathering system is in steady state, you effectively activate GatherBot and it handles everything. Um, so, so control room operators have been quite, quite excited about that. It's been, been great to hear. So enhancing the, the asset integrity and lifespan with GatherBot, of course. So GatherBot enhances the pipeline integrity via reducing the pressure variability up to 30%, resulting in reduced maintenance costs, extended asset life, uh, reduced integrity dig costs, and reduced probability of a leak incident. So you can see here in, in, uh, in this data set, you know, the, the historical data is showing um, quite, a, quite significant and frequent uh, pressure cycling. So GatherBot is able to minimize that. Of course, there are still going to be some changes, given that the goal is to maximize throughput. Um, but with those changes, it's, it is significantly less. You know, it's going to take us some time to get our data together, um, have these systems running live to fully understand uh, exactly how much this is, um, you know, enhancing pipe integrity. But um, we all know that anything we can do to, uh, to, to help with pipe integrity is a great thing. So LNG bought for a, a very different application, but wanted to take the time with folks to make sure that um, everyone uh, knows that, you know, it's not just pipeline. We are working on others and we've got some great first customers in pipeline. So we're, we're keen to keep working with them, um, but also keen to start expanding these capabilities to other control rooms, given the benefits that we've seen. So here's that, uh, that overview again. So increasing the ROI, reducing the number of commands, um, asset integrity, of course, and uh, automating the operational, operational tasks. Um, so we'll leave this one here. But uh, LNG bot is a key component um, of, of a net zero strategy. So up to 45% reduction in flaring during a startup. Um, flaring is a, is a big contributor to emissions. So anything we can do to uh, lower that is great. Um, so decrease your capital spend on emissions if you're paying a carbon tax, um, improving your revenue potential because you're, you're being more efficient and getting to your max rates quicker, um, and of course reducing the environmental impact. So LNG bot as well, um, enhancing the asset integrity and safety. Um, so consistently uh, safe operations, uh, increasing the asset integrity and useful life, 
and reduce asset maintenance costs. So, so what we saw was on the plate thin heat exchangers um, in a nitrogen rejection unit, actually, we were able to reduce the uh, temperature exceedances during a startup uh, by about 75%. Um, so during startups of these complex assets, um, you know, it's, it is quite difficult for a control room operator to maintain uh, the correct rate of change on these cool downs on, on these plate fin heat exchangers and, and make sure that they're staying within those limits. Um, not only are, you know, uh, any component of an LNG facility uh, potentially dangerous if there's an issue, it's also extremely costly to, to, uh, to replace these plate fin heat exchangers. So, so this was something that folks have been quite excited about as well. So um, reducing human interactions with LNG bot. So same idea, up to 99%. I believe in this case, we went from about 1,600 commands down to six. Um, six because there were some, uh, there were some uh, hand valves. And so there had to be some call outs to make sure that, uh, that those valves got, uh, that got activated by folks in the field. So again, back to your personnel performing high value tasks. Another interesting thing with this one was a 16 hour startup actually spans two control room operator shifts, which poses its own problem. So for 12 straight hours, you're doing, you know, what the first slide was showing if you're bouncing around and you're working really hard. And then you have the added complexity of trading that off to, to your new, uh, your new person who's coming in to take over for that night shift. Um, so, so the fatigue coming out of one of these uh, incidents would be extremely high. And, uh, and then of course we want that consistently executed operation. So we've seen in both pipeline, um, gathering system, you know, LNG, we've seen startups vary from quite quick, um, with lots of exceedances or issues to very, very slow and long. Um, so tightening that, uh, that up and, and having your, your control room operator who, um, you know, at two in the afternoon is operating just as well at, at two in at two o'clock in the morning. So that's super important as well. So software solutions, um, super important point. <laughs> we are not a consultancy. Um, we firmly believe that modern software techniques and modern software scalability is the best way to tackle problems like this and to empower control room operators with the best tools possible. Um, again, to reiterate, if these folks decided to, decided to leave, um, I'm sure the engineers could hack something together. But um, without your control room operators, you really, you really don't have much operating these billion dollar assets. So, so they're extremely, extremely important and giving them the best tools we can are important. So something that we get quite a bit um, is why don't we just build this ourselves? So having come from the industry, um, there's a lot of really, really smart folks in this industry. Um, and and it's, it's a great, you know, to be perfectly frank, I tried to build this myself when I was in the industry. Um, what I've learned since coming out of the industry is that is that is not always the best approach. Um, I'm sure it can be done. Um, however, you know, we've all heard of the, the homegrown software that five years later had to be replaced. So, so keeping that in mind, um, you know, what, what, why is software um, good, great for these types of applications? So software, multi-system, efficiency-driven. So scalable, repeatable, maintainable. And I think people forget the maintainable five years down the road when the person who architected that solution, um, who really was their baby when they move on to a new role, or they get a promotion, um, or they just, you know, they, they decide it's not of interest anymore. So then who's going to maintain it? And I think that's something that, um, that uh, I've seen in heavy industry becomes, becomes problematic. So, you know, we go through the, the design, the build and deploy, and the deploy and maintain. We handle all of that uh, ourselves. Um, we are also using uh, modern software building techniques. Our, our head of engineering is, um, he is from uh, a few startups in Silicon Valley. He's been at Google. He's been at a machine learning hedge fund. Um, he really is uh, up to date on the best um, software engineering practices. And, uh, and because of that, um, what we're building is very robust. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I think that that's something that can be can be forgotten. Another kind of neat thing about that is, you know, in our industry and in, in oil and gas specifically, you know, we want top talent. Well, a great way to get top talent and that top talent out of Silicon Valley is to work with work with startup companies solving really cool problems um, because that's fun for them. So, in-house projects are costly and non-scalable. Um, I have seen this many a time. I know of one pipeline company who is currently replacing their entire homegrown SCADA system. Um, you know, people forget about it though, because it seemed like a great idea five years ago. 
So they are unique, they are inefficient, and they are costly. So, so these designs are always system specific. You know, we're designing for um, all assets. We're designing to make sure that we can capture them all. So because of that, we're able to keep our costs lower. Um, you're building and deploying. You know, you're not building and deploying inside uh, with a unique solution. You're not building and deploying um, for with all of your assets in mind. You're building and deploying for that specific problem. Um, so not scalable um, across different or new solutions. So if something new happens or you decide that you want to build a new product, you may be starting from scratch again. You may not have built all the correct APIs to, uh, to do that uh, or have those foresight. So costly uh, to deploy and maintain. Um, so not cost effective to maintain um, depending on, so, so software like ours, we have uh, quite a number of, of specialist engineers, PhDs. Now it's they it's no problem for them to work with or maintain five, 10, 20 customers. Um, however, for individual companies to hold, depending on the size of the company, of course, um, to hold multiple folks like that on staff can be quite challenging. Um, so yeah, so system specific as talked about. So uh, RIPA is much more sophisticated uh, than simple APC. I like to throw that in as well. We usually get that question. Um, well, isn't this just APC? Um, APC works fantastic and amazingly in steady state. Um, we, our goal is to work during very unsteady state and very complex operations. And, and that includes the startups, the swings, the shutdowns of these types of assets. Um, so, you know, APC, the techniques are, are multivariable, model predictive, constraint handling, trajectory following. Um, you're typically implemented using function blocks or custom programming at the DCS level. Um, SCADA doesn't even actually have the capability. Um, and it's typically leveraged during a steady state continuous operation. Um, sometimes you'll see a consulting job where it is leveraged a little bit in, an, in a different way. Um, so the techniques that we use, of course, are APC and sequencing, so rules-based logic. We will use physics-based predictive modeling. We'll use continuous ML capabilities where needed. Um, simultaneous implementation at the DCS and SCADA and supervisory levels, so we're able to talk to all levels depending on what's needed. And, uh, and leverage during all phases of the operation. So we are focused on those startups in pipeline because SCADA does not have that, uh, that APC capability during steady state. We do use it. Um, we do use it there. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if we're at a gas plant and they already have it, then there's no need. So where do we sit? Uh, we do integrate uh, directly uh, next to... Uh, so directly into the control room next to the SCADA DCS. So we are not embedded inside of the SCADA DCS. We aren't using SCADA DCS functionality. We're outside of it. Why I feel that's super important is actually from a safety layer um, standpoint. We are not, um, none of our computations are potentially interfering with the critical safety constraints inside of the SCADA DCS. We are then able to write to the historian um, for you know, ease of troubleshooting and, um, and trending for your control room operators. And then uh, the way that it's working is the exact same way that a control room operator would. So instead of the control room operator issuing the commands, they're now issuing that simple one button click. So whether that's an on or that's an off, and then uh, the correct software is executing all of the intermediate commands in between for the control room operator. So whether those are the pump stops, pump starts, the pressure set point commands, um, depending, you know, temperature set point commands in LNG, uh, those are all being written by, by Crux, and then you would see them displayed in the historian as a Crux executed command, which is super important. Oh, and we connect by OPC or MQTT. <laughs> Interesting, uh, important additional fact. So we do have an exciting new announcement. We have uh, been working with a customer who has accelerated um, a product, uh, a product on our roadmap, um, because they were very excited about it. Um, and we have been too. It's something we've been envisioning for a while. It is a pipeline specific. So we are excited to announce that product and it is a new optimization solution that will dramatic, dramatically decrease the excessive costs companies are facing related to power. So, um, this is especially important across the U S um, cause you're going from County to County and you have all these different power providers, um, you know, Canada province to province as well. Um, and then tied to those costs, of course, are emissions, the less power you're using, the more environmentally friendly you are. So to our second poll question, and I'll give folks more time on this one. So what is the name of our power optimization product? Power Opt, Power Bot, Power Optimizer, or Power Calc? Sometimes there's a theme with how we name things. <laughs> Can you give folks a few more minutes? I'll have a sip of my coffee.
All right, let's see some results. Power bot. Funny, wrong. <laughs> we actually decided to change it to power bot or power opt. We did think about power opt at first or power bot at first because we do have the trend of like the bot names, um, you know, marketing geniuses that we are. But uh, we thought that power opt would be would be more fun because we're we're op automated optimization, um, yeah, beyond uh, costly intermittent manual execution. So, so really, it's that closed loop operational control based on the optimization between the dynamically changing power costs and the scheduled volumetric flow flow over a time period for that batch pipeline. Um, you know, we're looking at an application as well into the gathering system world, but uh, but yeah, the the transmission lines moving across those counties, um, something that that's super valuable. I know companies that I've worked at, they have teams of engineers working on this. So being able to take their amazing work and integrate it into and have their, their inputs input into a closed loop rather than the control room operator having some readout or printout in an email that they're trying to implement as they're doing the other million things uh, will greatly add value to the great work that they do. So, so yeah, that's, um, you know, power opt is, uh, is something we're, we're pretty excited about. So I'd love to tell more if we've got some questions in the, in the Q and a parting thoughts. So I hope I didn't talk too fast, but I probably did. I am from Newfoundland and I do talk fast. So, but I did have quite a bit of material was really excited to get through um, those um, the different examples for folks. I know that that's the most meaningful. A lot of these audiences are, are really technical and, and super sharp, and so I wanted to make sure that folks had a real concrete examples that they can uh, learn about and dig into. So to recap, you know the benefits of us uh, of Crux OCM are our uh, human factors, um, increasing revenues, of course. So we want to really decrease those human factors, increase those revenues. Um, those, those cost reductions. So that's like our, you know, our power opt capability, um, asset integrity. So really reducing that pressure cycling as much as we can and or decreasing those, for example, in, in LNG and then, uh, net zero initiatives, right? Like, you know, we're all, we're all looking for that magic silver bullet. That's just going to make us get to net zero. Um, we've got old assets and, uh, and, and making, you know, producing and moving oil and gas safely and efficiently involves, uh, involves the assets that we have. So we need to work with what we have and, and make them as efficient as possible. So yeah, so to find out more about us, um, and what we've presented uh, to enhance your bottom line or help deliver on your ESG initiatives, please reach out to me directly. There's also website forms. Um, you know, I think there's a little bit of content here on the side. So, so yeah, so thank you. Um, and I would love to open up to questions if anyone has any. Great. Thanks, Vicki. We can questions. We do have time if anyone else would like to submit some, but we'll get started right away. First question we have is, does RIPA reduce or increase cyber risk in your opinion? Has a full risk analysis been performed on RIPA versus a human operator from a cyber exploit perspective? Great question. Yeah, so we actually sit inside of the uh, control room. So inside of the control room firewalls. Um, what we like about that is that, um, you know, individual companies are in charge of their, and they have the control of their own cybersecurity. Um, I did quite a bit of research into the Colonial Pipeline incident, as well as um, I talked about it quite a bit as well. Um, so the weakness there was actually a single sign-on. Um, in that case, you know, if, if the single sign-on gives them access to the control room, uh, our IPA um, would make it easier for them to shut down an asset. However, it would make them make it safer because they probably don't know how to do it. Um, in the colonial uh, situation, though, there wasn't actually um, any access to the SCADA systems, so they were all shut down. Um, what, meant, what, what that meant was that folks had to actually go out and, and operate the pump stations via the PLCs at site uh, because there was no other way to do it. Um, if if uh, the RIPA platform had actually been there, there would have been another way to do it. Um, there would have been a way for our, our company to go in through our previously authorized VPN tunnels uh, and, and get things up and running uh, from our end of the system. So that's something that we certainly could have done. Um, all of our software does sit on there. We would be going into their system to get it, though. It does sit inside of the firewalls. Uh, so we have done uh, risk analysis 
on Ripper versus a human operator from a cyber exploitation perspective. Uh, that is something we have actually hired a VCSO to look at. Um, the VCSO was uh, very happy with us being on-prem, and I think that that's something that's going to be the norm for us for a while, uh, given those considerations and how important it is that we stay inside those firewalls. Great. Thank you. Next question we have is, do you use ML? Yes, we do. So um, that's, that's a good question, too. I like to make sure that we, you know, we back it up, right? Like, we're all about what's the goal. Um, I know there's a lot of companies out there that are AIML for this, AIML for that. What is the value that's actually being delivered? You know, that's really the important part. Um, the, the important part is, you know, we're automating how a control room operator is executing, and, and that's the value. Um, could we use a pure ML solution? For sure we could. Um, would that be the easiest and the fastest way to do it? No, it wouldn't, right? Why do you need the gold-plated drill when you can use the hammer? Um, and if the hammer solves the problem. So that's that's really how we think of it. Um, the main place that we use ML is we will use it for, for specifically for soft sensors. So in that LNG example, when it comes to the cooling of plate fin heat exchangers, um, you have a dynamic moving set point target. Um, so we will use ML to calculate that and solve and, and then wrap our control around that. Um, so, or if there's a, you know, a flow meter missing in, uh, in a pipeline system, we would use ML as well to solve for that. Great, thanks so much. Next question we have is, what are the IT requirements to run the system? Obviously, that would depend on the number of inputs the system has, but could you give an example? Um, for 300 inputs, the processing or GPU power that is required is X. Oh, geez. Okay. This one I might have to get back to you on because I can't remember, but I know that like we're working with a system that has probably maybe like 50 inputs and we just have like one virtual machine spun up and like that's more than enough. Um, it is pretty minimal. Like it's definitely not like, like I know it's not like overwhelming for customers because when we give the customers the numbers and what we need, they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> so I can, I can get back with the specifics though um, on exactly what, uh, what hardware is required. Um, but yeah, it's like, we've had, we've been able to run a pipeline system on a phone. So it's certainly not overwhelming in a simulated Great. phone, yeah. <laughs> not, not a real pipeline system, but a simulated pipeline system. We've been able to run our software on a phone, uh, and execute. Great. Next question we have is RIPA and bot believe they are software solution. Are they working with control systems such as DCS, SCADA, or is it independent system? Are they similar to DMC, APC? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, they are software, you are correct. Um, and they are working with, with the DCS and SCADA. So we actually, um, there was a, a slide back and, and you guys can definitely uh, scroll back and see it. But what we do is we connect via OPC or MQTT um, and we're reading and writing data into the control system um, in real time. So similar to the concept of, uh, of APC when in steady state, we do use APC as one of the tools in our toolbox to be able to execute on you know, these more complex operations such as startups or shutdown. Uh, but yeah, we, we definitely sit um, outside of the DCS SCADA, so we're not an app inside of it um, or a program you know, inside of it. We're, we're outside so that we have the flexibility and that we're not ever competing with the critical safety constraints that are inside of the, the SCADA DCS. So hope that's Great. clear. Also happy to, and, and, and any of these questions, like super happy to go in more depth. Um, yeah, another time. So if folks want to want to dig in more, we can definitely get in touch. Great. Next question we have is, what happens if the required system inputs are not available? Can you deploy a Wi-Fi signaling system to support the software? Okay, not sure I understand Wi-Fi signaling system, but if inputs are not available, currently we're defaulting back um, so depending on the criticality of the input. So, so if it's just an intermediate flow meter and it's not a big deal, we can just recalculate around it um, like a leak, de leak detection system does. Um, however, if there's something critical that's not, um, that's not available, so there's a calm out, um, our system will just shut down. So, you know, a, a safely uh, leave, it will do like a, a set point match and just leave all the set points as is for the control room operators that they know exactly what's going on and then just shut itself off. And of course, um, depending on the alarming that um, control room operators want, there can be an alarm that says that it's it's been reverted back to manual control. So that's how we handle that. So again, like if something's going wrong in, in your plane, uh, you're going to revert to uh, your pilot 
uh, doing the work. So that's that's exactly what we do right now in in those calm out situations. And the Wi-Fi signaling, I'm not 100% sure exactly what that means. So again, if you want to touch base later and give me a little more context, that would be awesome. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Next question we have is, can RIPA reduce the possibility of reducing human error given that an operator can make a mistake and press the wrong button? That's exactly what we do. <laughs> yes, love this question. So, um, so my background, just to give a little more color, is um, I trained as a control room operator, um, a commission control systems in the field, and this was just like, it was nutters to me. It's like, okay, so we have a paper procedure, and I've got to start up this like, you know, forty pump station pipeline, and like, and I got to make sure I don't push the wrong button, right, <laughs> and shut this thing down because it's like millions of dollars if I do. So that is, that's actually what the, the key problem that we set out to solve was really helping control room operators with making sure that, um, you know, they, they, if the phone starts ringing, they can answer the phone and this thing is going to execute for them. Um, so, so huge on, on mitigating that human error, right? Because human errors happen during those dynamic events. They don't happen when everything's running in steady state and everything's great, which is where your typical APC layer is. They actually happen when, when things, are, things are intense. And so anything we can do to minimize the intensity of those experiences for them um, absolutely reduces human error and mistakes. Um, so that's, that's been, uh, yeah, we, we figured out later that there's a, a bunch of, um, you know, uh, it up revenue uplift and, and asset integrity benefits to our IPA. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the main thing that we were going after was, was helping control arm operators and, and setting them up with tools to, uh, to be successful. Yeah. I love that question. Great. <laughs> Great. We have time for one more question. And that question is, are you able to address concerns with SIS with RIPA? SIS, you mean like the safety system? Um, like the SIS, like the external safety system? I believe that that's correct. Is there, is there a way to get that person to confirm or is that not possible? Um, we can try. Is that even a plant? Yeah, let me just, I can do a real quick Google, but I believe that's what you're talking about, like in a plant environment, is the SIS safety system. Yeah, yeah, safety, SIS, safety improvement system, SIS protocols. I think that that's it. So, so yeah, so in uh, typically Daniel wrote, in, yes, that's what he means. Yes? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Okay, yeah. So, are you able to address concerns? Yeah. So, if there's concerns in in the SIS, so like I know in like the plant environment, you have the DCS and the SIS, and you try to keep the critical safety constraints out. That's another reason why we wanted to be outside as well, because we didn't want to interfere with any critical safety constraints. So, if there are concerns in the SIS, so something's not, um, you know, so say like on a pipeline, for example, you have to do like a D rate. Um, then you can you can absolutely use RIPA to do that um, and and to accommodate those maybe more different types of or temporary um, safety constraints or concerns that you want to handle. So I believe that that's it. Um, you know we need to understand them, of course, like when we're when we're integrating. Um, the way our business model works as well is that we're a subscription, so we're not a one-time consultancy. So if folks um, if they have something like this come up, they can come to us. We're available. Um, and we can make sure to, to get that in. So yeah, kind of a bit of a vague answer because I don't know the specifics, but in short, yes, we just need to you know, dig in and understand it. Um, but our goal is to never interfere with an existing SIS or, or an existing DCS safety constraints, SCADA safety constraints. We wanna be outside those. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vicki, for your interesting and informative webinar this morning. For those in the audience, if you want to listen again, this webinar will be available on demand shortly. And finally, thank you to you, wherever you are, for taking the time to listen in. We look forward to having you on one of our upcoming events or on-demand webinars, and you can check those out at oilandgasiq.com or industrialtransformationnetwork.com. And again, thank you so much, Vicki, for your time today. Yes, and thanks for all the great questions. These are awesome. You folks are engaged, even though I talked real fast. <laughs>